Okay. So uh, as always, I uh, um, shamelessly copied the presentation of another group. In this case, it was uh, cohort one. Um, so thank you to them for putting this together and um, I've added some bits here and there and changed a couple of things. So uh, these two chapters work really well together. Um, they're about uh, measuring performance and then how to uh, how to figure out where to focus your efforts on improving performance and when to apply effort to that. Um, so I want to uh, digress immediately into this, this kind of concept of time. Um, so there's two big types of time in almost everything that we do, and especially in coding. There's person time and there's machine time. Um, machine time is cheap. Um, it's, you know, until you get up to, uh, to giant data sets and things like that, it's essentially free for the cost of buying your computer, which you have to do anyway. Um, person time is priceless. You can never get that back. So um, it's always important to keep that in mind when you're thinking about performance and code. Um, so things like uh, if your code is slow and safe, that's better than fast and unsafe in, in, in most cases. These are not universal, but um, kind of most of the time these are true. Uh, slow and readable code is uh, better than fast and indecipherable, especially for future you or uh, the next person has to read it. Um, slow, and, uh, slow and fast to write is better than uh, fast and has hours of finding a small optimizations in general. So that said, you know, like with anything, there's always exceptions. Um, so first of all, uh, good coding practice and remembering a few, uh, a few techniques will make code faster and also makes it kind of cleaner to write um, and doesn't take a lot of extra effort. So that's where it's worth putting in some time. Um, so time spent waiting for slow code is person time, um, unless it's something that you're, you're uh, running as a batch and leaving to run and you know that it's going to take a long time and you can do something else. Um, slow execution on the order of kind of like, you know, seconds to tens of seconds can, will break your flow and it delays iteration of code and uh, delays um, kind of you know, iterating on getting a product out of things. Um, so uh, there's this famous uh, Donald Nuth code. Nuth or Nuth? I don't know. Anyway. Um, uh, Brett, so yeah. uh, do you want to show us a presentation? Or? Oh, I'm. <laughs> Uh, Sorry, I, I, I mean, I thought night it's just talking. No, 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 I, I <laughs> completely spaced out on actually sharing my screen. Everyone's just like, wow, you must be following some notes or something. But okay, sorry about that. Um, okay. This should work a little better. <laughs> okay. Um, let's get the title out of the way. Okay. So the, uh, the, the famous uh, Donald Nuth quote, um, which actually turns out to be from uh, popularized by, uh, um, by Nuth and was actually by um, Sir Tony Hoare. Um, it's the, you know, it's paraphrased in a bunch of different ways. The real quote is, uh, we should forget about small efficiencies, say 97% of the time. Premature optimization um, is the root of all evil, yet we should not pass up our opportunities in that critical 3%. A good programmer will not be lulled in complacency by such Complacency by such reasoning, you will be wise to look carefully at the critical code only after the code has been identified. Um, so the real meaning for these two chapters is uh, don't get caught up in making small things faster, um, but keep efficient coding practices in, in mind while developing. So people often kind of interpret this to mean, you know, don't think about efficiency at all while you're first writing your code. You can always think about that later, uh, but that's not entirely true. It's it's faster to and more efficient to develop with some, you know, with the, some basic attention to efficiency, like things like if you're using a for loop, um, um, allocate your, your output vector before you start, you know, just really basic stuff like that. Um, and uh, if anybody's interested in this kind of stuff, uh, Wikiquote has a bunch of great uh, Nuth quotes. Um, even though I am not a low level C programmer, uh, he's somebody who's got a lot of Cool stuff to learn from. Uh, okay, so uh, the first chapter is how to, uh, so the topic here is how to go fast. So the first chapter is uh, um, before you can make it go fast, you need to find out what's making it slow. Um, the second chapter, chapter 24, is uh, figuring out how to make things faster. Um, so what's making things slow? Uh, the first thing to do is to find out what part of your code is, is slowing things down. Uh, and the way to do that is by profiling the code. Uh, in this case, we're using uh, uh, profviz. Um, 
So it's a statistical or sampling profiler, which means that it periodically stops the execution of the code and looks at how long something has taken since the last time it's checked and keeps, it keeps a log of all these things. Um, so the example in the, in the book is the series of three functions that are kind of uh, calling each other. Um, F has a pause and then calls G and H. Um, G has a pause and then calls H and H just has a pause. So if we run uh, profviz on this, um, the output that you get is this nice two-part thing where you see um, the memory and time taken by uh, each, each call within the, within the functions that are being called. Um, and then uh, this bottom thing is called a flame graph. Um, it's just a way of kind of visualizing how, how the code is executing over time from the, from the start of the, so this zero is the start of the execution of, uh, of F. Um, you can see the first thing it does is it has that um, tenth of a second pause. Um, and then it executes G. So the things above are the, so the, the uh, rows here above are the things that are executing within the things on the, um, on the bottom. So it's kind of like a vertical nesting. Um, so F is calling pause, then it's calling G. G in turn pauses and then calls H. Uh, the only call in H is that pause. And then um, this pause here is the one in, in, uh, um, in G um, at the end of, oh, sorry. No, I'm sorry, that's, uh, uh, this pause is the pause in G. Um, G is executing H, which has a pause. And then we're returning uh, back to execute H in the function F. And that just adds the, the pause. Um, okay. Uh, just stop me if anybody has any questions. Okay, so uh, memory profiling. Um, that other line in uh, the profviz output um, tells you what what's happening with memory. So the uh, the right hand side of this is uh, memory being allocated. The left hand side is memory being garbage collected. So if you if you run profviz and see a big GC bar um, in the flame graph, that tells you that garbage collection is taking up a lot of your time, uh, which should be a warning here that something's that you might be able to do something better here. Um, and if you look at the function that we're executing, it's a for loop. And uh, um, this is one of those uh, cases where premature optimization, optimization would be a really good thing because uh, rather than going back and fixing this later, it's something that we can just use as, as good coding practice to pre-allocate that vector so that it doesn't need to be um, making a copy of X every time it, it executes that for loop. Um, okay. So um, profiling has some limitations and confusing things. Um, it can't profile C code because it doesn't know what's going on outside of R. Um, so you can, you'll can you see that the, um, the C function has executed and how long it took, but you won't see anything internally about the calls that it's producing. Um, so anonymous functions can make things difficult because your flame graph and your, uh, um, your flame graph won't have any names on it. So it's really hard to see what's doing what. So if you need to profiling, profile something where you're using a lot of anonymous functions, uh, it's better to name them and then uh, call them by name. Um, and then lazy evaluation can make things a little confusing as for me, as always. Um, so in this uh, example here, um, we've got a function i um, that's pausing and then uh, producing the value 10. Um, and this function j, um, it's taking an input X and adding 10 to it. Um, so if we call J of I, um, I is executed within J because of the lazy execution. So it ends up stacking on top of J. Um, and that's the function that takes the most time because it has this pause in it. Um, so yeah, so it seems like I is being called by J, but in reality, it's just the, the lazy evaluation. Um, so then moving on to the second part of, uh, of kind of figuring out why, where your code is slow, the next, the next step is benchmarking. Um, so if you found out where your code is slow and you wanna start saying, okay, well, um, how long is this piece taking? Um, what are, 
can I try a couple of alternate approaches and see if they're if they're any faster? That's where micro benchmarking comes into effect. Um, so the idea is that you're taking a, a small chunk of code, just a single function, um, and you're um, seeing how long it takes for a number of iterations. Um, and I find that the best pack, this is the package they use in the book, and I've also become really attached to the bench package. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's really nice. It, it provides a lot of really good convenience features that make benchmarking easier. So it uses the highest precision, precision timing APIs available, um, often to nanosecond precision. Um, and uh, one really important thing is it checks the output for equivalence. Um, so each expression that it's comparing uh, before it will run, um, by default, it'll, it'll uh, say, I'm trying to remember what it uses to determine equality. I think it's uh, is equal. Um, but in any case, you know, obviously, if you're trying to um, compare two options to do the same thing, you want to make sure that they do the same thing before you compare them. Um, it also has a really nice uh, um, uh, subfunction called press that will uh, um, map over a grid of iterations and inputs. So uh, um, one thing you'll notice in some of the examples is that uh, um, the speed per iteration depends a lot on how many iterations you do. So if there's a lot of setup for a function the first time it runs, um, then running a low number of iterations will show a, a big performance penalty compared to um, showing compared to running a lot of iterations of that function. Um, so you can, uh, with press, you can uh, test a range of uh, the size of the input and the number of times to run that input. Uh, it's also got some nice plotting features, which make it really easy to you know, kind of graphically see what's going on. Uh, okay, so let's see an example. Um, so in this example, we're setting up a, um, a vector to, to use as test data. Um, and then we are um, running benchmark, um, craftily named package. Um, on we're going to compare two ways to get the square root of x. Uh, one is to use the square root function. One is to raise x to the uh, the half power. Um, you'd think that internally these would be equivalent, but they are not. Um, so when you run this, you see that uh, aha, square root is much faster than than raising x to the fifth power. But this brings up a really important point about benchmark. You might immediately say, okay, well I never want to use x to the fifth to the uh, um, half power again. Um, that's not necessarily the case, even though it's a fair bit slower. If I'm, even if I'm uh, raising 100 things to the fifth power, that's still only, a, um, that's still only a 200 microseconds of my life, um, which is not significant on any time scale. If you're doing this millions of times, then it's better to use square root. Um, and again, this is a place where, since it's not really a lot of the um, a lot of mental load to use square root of x instead of x to the, the half power, you might consider just using that by default in your coding. But it's not something that you would you would say, aha, I found my problem for these 10 times that I'm taking the square root of the number. Um, okay, so this is the uh, plot output of uh, a benchmark. Um, you can see that it's uh, um, the uh, the x-axis is the time it takes for iteration. Um, and the expression is on the y-axis. Um, so you notice that these are all long-tailed uh, right, uh, right distributions. Uh, it's because there might be something going on on your computer simultaneously, uh, or sometimes the initial, initial runs of something take longer. Um, this is why it's good to use the median uh, output of uh, benchmark as your, as your metric. Uh, because you're really not interested in the in the mean, which would be somewhere up in these. You're usually not interested in the mean; it would be somewhere um, up a little higher here, um, whereas the median would be in the in the bulk of the data. Okay. All right. So that was that was it for uh, um, chapter 23. Um, any questions on the on the profiling and and benchmarking? Um, before we started, uh, Hannes was pointing out that uh, the exercise for Pruff is, uh, has an issue with it. I think he's, I think he's in the chat. He put in a, uh, um, a pull request that he submitted for that. Um, we we're kind of guessing about what happened, and I, I'm wondering if the uh, if uh, um, Pruff is was updated since the book was published or something like that. Um, okay, so. Uh, Chapter 24 is once you've figured out what's slow, 
how do you make it go faster? Um, so, um, all right, so this, these main techniques for, for um, kind of working on, on that issue. So uh, organizing your code um, into small functions is useful because it makes uh, profiling, it makes uh, benchmarking very easy and it also makes profiling easier. Um, looking for existing fast solutions. So there's a lot of um, work on making R faster. Either people have implemented things in uh, uh, C++, um, C++ code, or, um, or just have found a faster way to do things. And often you can find those by looking around. Um, it makes, it's not important to reinvent the wheel when somebody's already kind of spent a lot of time making something fast. Um, and the importance of being lazy, we'll get to that. Uh, vectorization is, is always, it's always faster in R to get to the C code as fast as you can. Sometimes you'll, you'll hear people um, talk about that for um, when they talk about uh, being fast or efficient in R. And what that means is to think about um, how to get to the underlying, um, the underlying uh, external implementation of something um, using as few iterations in R as you can. So something like vectorization, you're immediately getting to a vectorized function in C++ or to a function in C++ that's, that's uh, um, doing all of your vector operations rather than uh, doing the iteration within R and running that C++ function for each iteration of your, of your, of your vector, for each element of your vector. Um, and then we've already talked about copying data, which is pops up. Um, surprisingly often. Okay, so organizing your code. What does what does Hadley mean here? Um, the, the idea is to write a, a function for for each approach that you want to test. So let's say we want to see uh, we want to make a, a faster mean. So we say, okay, well, um, our first function is just the mean, you know, the built-in mean function. Um, and then the function we want to compare against that is the sum of our vector divided by the length of our vector. Um, so the next step is to generate uh, test cases. Uh, in this case, we're just creating a, a random vector of uh, um, uh, one to the fifth in length. Um, and then we're going to compare the var variance by, uh, by benchmarking. So again, it's a friend benchmark. Um, here, they're just pulling out some of the data. Um, I'm not sure that's this is really necessary here anymore because I think they've improved the output of, of uh, benchmarks since this was put together. But in any case, we can see that uh, um, so our uh, um, our mean function is a little faster. And I thought as I was going through this in the text that they were saying that the, uh, the built-in one was a little faster. Um, yeah, you might be surprised by the results. Uh, um, Oh no, never mind. I've got that backwards. Uh, uh, the built-in mean is slower than uh, sum of length, and that's the reason. Is so it's often helpful with these these speed up things to think about the reasons. Uh, so in this case, uh, mean the built-in mean is slower because it's actually going over the vector twice to uh, be more numerically accurate. Um, but okay, so this gives us the ability to compare two bits of code that do the same thing, and we can compare any number of of uh, um, bits that do the same thing if you want to compare multiple approaches. Um, okay, so checking for existing solutions. Um, you can use CRAN task views to see if there's something that, uh, that pops up for what you're trying to do. Um, you can look at the reverse dependencies of uh, uh, C++, R, C++, um, to see if there's something that is that has, that uses uh, um, RCPP um, that does what you want to do, which is an indicator that it's probably very fast. Um, and then you can go out and talk to people. You know, if you found something in your some small bit of your code and you have a reprex um, that's slow, you can say, you know, go on a Stack Overflow or R for Data Science and just say, hey, yeah, this this code is slow. What's what's going on with that? Um, and then, okay, another approach is to do as little as possible. Um, so. A lot of um, the more, I'm not sure if high level is the right term here, but the uh, um, yeah, the more high level a function is, the more uh, um, the more user facing it is, the more it'll the more it'll try to do to make sure it's doing the right thing. 
and each of those things that it's doing takes time. Um, so one way to get around this is to pick functions that are uh, that are tailored to a specific type of input or the specific problem that you're having, meaning that it'll have to do less of that trying to figure out what you're trying to do. Um, so for instance, uh, row sums, call sums, row means, call means are faster than uh, implications that use apply because they're vectorized. Um, v apply is faster than s apply because it specifies the output type. So uh, um, s apply has to figure out what the output type is going to be. Um, and then, uh, so um, any, um, any x equals 10 is faster than uh, 10 in x because uh, testing for equality is simpler than testing for whether something's included in the set. So it's just less to do when it's iterating internally. Um, so avoid coercion because coercion takes time. Um, so for example, uh, don't give a data frame to a function that requires a matrix like apply. Um, and again, that's another example of uh, person time versus machine time. Um, I, would, I would never think of that when I'm just, you know, um, doing a quick map using apply or something like that. Uh, I wouldn't really think about converting my, my data to a matrix because my time to do that is not really worth the, the difference in time for apply. Um, if I'm doing something that's, uh, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of a list, a list that's uh, hundreds of thousands of elements long that I'm feeding into apply, then that would be time to think about um, optimizing the input. Um, so, okay, some other tips. Uh, um, read CSV, uh, specify known column types, or use reader functions because they're faster. Um, or uh, I think, I remember, I think data table F read and reader are, are about tied for speed right now. Um, there's some work on rooms that's supposed to be much faster, but I haven't really looked into it. Um, you know, and again, if you're reading a small CSV file, none of this stuff matters. But if you're reading hundreds of thousands of lines, then it starts to be important and take up your time to um, to wait for something to load. Um, so if you specify known levels in a factor, that makes it faster. Um, in the cut function, if you use labels equals false or find interval, that's a little faster because it gives it less to do. Um, so um, yeah, Un unlisting something where you don't use the names is faster than unlisting something where you do. Um, and when you're finding interactions, if you're dropping that's faster because it has less to do again. Um, okay, so here's an example uh, for doing less. So in this case, we're, we're using mean again, uh, and we're comparing uh, three ways of uh, running the internal mean function. So mean, as, as you've probably picked up during the course, is a generic, and it dispatches based on what type of object x is. Um, if x is a just vector of numbers, it's going to call a mean default, mean dot default. Um, so we say, oh, well, maybe we should just do that directly. Um, and then if we if we really want to get daring, we can call the internal mean function and drop it directly to the C code underneath. Or this, you know, I'm not even sure if that C is an internal function. Um, so if we benchmark these three things against each other, we'll see that sure enough, the uh, um, the internal implementation is fastest by what four uh, four to five times faster than uh, um, than mean default, which in turn is about twice as fast as uh, um, calling mean with dispatch. But you know, so we're initially saying, okay, well, dispatch is terrible. It's you know, why why would we ever want to use dispatch? Um, but you notice that there's not we're not doing a very long vector here. So if we do a larger vector suddenly we see that everything starts to line up a little bit. Um, so there's, there's two lessons here. One is that uh, um, it's important to um, benchmark things using a vector that, using, using example data that kind of mirrors what your, what your real world example is. Uh, so it'll tell you if you're really looking at speed up or not. Um, I guess it's three things. Um, so the second thing is that uh, if we are run, if we're getting the mean of a, of 100 numbers, then none of these, these are all the same as far as humans are concerned. So it doesn't matter. Um, and then the third thing is that uh, even though running the straight mean function is the slowest, it's by far the safest because if you feed it the wrong type of data, it'll tell you something about that. If you, uh, um, it's, it's gonna be 
safer and it's going to result in uh, more coherent code if anything odd happens to it, like if somebody feeds it a vector of characters or something like that. Um, so in many of these cases, it's not worth it to go faster. Um, so just a, the, what, what, R, what R tells you when you try to run an internal function, um, only true R wizards should ever consider using this function and only R developers can add to the list of internal functions. So a warning like that should tell you that unless you really know your use case, then probably best to, to skip it. Now, if you're getting the mean of a, um, a million numbers, then it might be worth uh, optimizing in that way. Okay. Okay, so, uh, um, so this example is on avoiding coercion. So uh, as data frame is slow because it coerces each element to the data frame. Um, so instead we could uh, just store our data in a named list of equal length vectors and just call it a data frame because S3 objects let us do that. Um, so this quick df function um, just assigns the class of the input to data frame um, and then it sets the row, the, uh, the row names. So, um, Let's see, so we're signing it uh, the letters and so a uh, vector of numbers, a vector of letters. Um, and randoms, okay. So we've got, uh, um, sorry, the, the names are the, are the letters and the, uh, um, the vectors are this uh, um, thousand number long list of random numbers. Um, so, okay. So now if we benchmark this against as data frame, um, so we're comparing the uh, as data frame of our, of our sample data to uh, um, our quick df function of the sample data. Um, you can see that we're a lot faster with this quick df function. But again, so if this is in, uh, if this is in our code that we, we know exactly what we're gonna be doing with it and nobody's ever gonna say, oh, they wrote this cool function that's faster for data frames and not really look at it. Um, then it's great because we have a, a fairly decent speed up. But if somebody grabs your code and doesn't know that it, it skips these safety checks and uh, runs it with something else that's not the same length, uh, you're going to get these weird warnings that odds are you've never seen an R before because you haven't tried to do this before. Um, so this would require, again, a lot of person time to solve, and it's probably going to kill any time advantage that you get out of having a faster uh, being able to make a data frame faster, except in certain use cases. Sorry, I keep on picking on that um, person time versus machine time. Okay, so vectorization. We all know that that uh, vectorized functions are faster. Um, R is a, um, a language that's so vectorized that there's no such thing as a scalar. Um, so um, basically, the idea is to find as quickly as possible, the R function that's implemented in C and applies to your problem and get there through as few other steps as possible so that we're, we're, um, we're, we're getting down to the fast stuff as quickly as possible. Um, so things like, again, row sums, call sums, row means, call means, um, vectorized subsetting. Um, again, the, um, the cut and find interval functions. Um, so, yeah, and there's this article by Noam Ross, which I think I've read, but a long time ago. Um, I recall it being good. Uh, any case. Okay, avoiding copying. So um, again, there's that example of not allocating your, uh, your input vector. Um, we all know that's a bad thing. Um, okay, so let's see. So we're creating data here that's the random, that's a, uh, a random string of letters, and uh, I'm creating a um, a um, a uh, sorry a a vector with uh, um, ten of these um, ten of these uh, um, strings of fifty characters each, and a vector with a hundred of these uh, strings of fifty characters each. Um, okay, now we're going to Compare, um, okay, this function collapse that we're creating that uh, um, pre allocates the vector um, and uh, says excess. Um, okay, so it's, it's just pasting all these strings together. 
It's hard to go through the example examples any better. Um, okay, so uh, um, so we're, we're benchmarking, um, doing this with our collapse function for the um, length ten and length hundred example, and we're um, doing this with uh, paste uh, for the for the um, length ten and length hundred example. So you can probably guess that the faster we get to the uh, the C++ code, the paste runs, the, the better off we're going to be. So if we look at this, we'll see that um, the results from this are that uh, um, the looped iteration, the looped scenarios are slow. Um, the vector, the vectorized um, scenarios are fast using paste, um, and then it just gets better the more iterations you do of this. And I suspect that this would scale in an interesting way. Um, okay. All right. So I did not get through the uh, case study of the t test. So hopefully we can work through it together. Please uh, um, chime in if I'm missing something or um, if anything doesn't make sense. Um, okay. So we're creating some data here. Um, and then we are going to run some t tests on it and see if we can make that faster. Um, so okay, there's two two ways to run the uh, um, the t test built into R or into the stats package. Um, we can okay, so we are let me back one so you can see what this vector is. M is one thousand. Um, so we are running t tests a thousand times. Um, and we're using the formula interface first and looking at the, the statistic as the output. Um, and then we're doing the same t test, but in, instead of providing the uh, formula, we're uh, um, providing the two vectors to, to look at the, uh, the t test for. Um, OK, so the, the formula interface is slow. Um, and they're using the system time here instead of uh, um, instead of benchmark. I didn't get a chance to, to redo this with benchmark. Um, so the formula interface is slow. It takes about uh, half a second to do these thousand iterations. Um, the uh, um, supplying two vectors is about five times faster. So that's a nice initial speed up. Um, and we are. Okay, adding something to save values. Okay, anybody want to tell me why this is faster? They're now going with per. Um, they're mapping doubles, so that means that they know what type they're using. That might be why this is a little faster. Although actually, that's about the same speed as the previous iteration. So the previous iteration was uh, about a tenth of a second and I mean, uh, they say it, they only use it to save the value so okay all right so this, so it should be about the same speed and it actually makes sense the per is a little bit slower than uh, um than um a for loop because it per does more things it's it um I'm trying to remember what what it does but it does a lot of type safety things to make sure that everything comes out okay All right, so now we're going to apply the do less work idea to this. Um, so we're going to make our own t test function where we don't do all the stuff that the, the built in t test does. So we're basically just going to get that t statistic by doing the calculation directly. Um, and okay, so that makes sense. Um, so sure enough, this is a lot faster. Um, if you know t-test, you know that it produces a, um, a, an object of output that contains a bunch of stuff. Um, and I haven't looked into the code to see what it's doing behind the scenes, but I know it's more than just getting that t-statistic. Um, so that's now down to um, two hundredths of a second. So that's a very significant speed up. Um, so now um, down here, they're doing they're testing for equality. Um, which is again something that benchmark does automatically. Um, and okay, so now we're going to vectorize what was written in that previous example. 
um, by using row means and row sums. So that's getting us, instead of doing that, sorry, skipping back to the last slide. So instead of doing that kind of manually here, um, we're skipping straight to a vectorized way of doing it. And somebody can chime in if I'm glossing over this a little too much. I'm kind of going through this as we speak. Um, OK. And this is our fastest so far. It's a um, nine thousandths of a second. Um, so overall, in this example, we've sped up from um, half a second to do this to run this t-test a thousand times um, to um, nine thousandths of a second to run this t-test a thousand times. So again, if I was just running, you know, if I had a, um, uh, a bunch of list columns that I wanted to run a bunch of t-tests on and I had, you know, a hundred of them or a thousand of them and there wasn't all that much data, this isn't going to make a difference and the time to do all this coding wouldn't be worth it. Um, but if you end up with something that's production code that needs to produce a plot really quickly, or you know, in this case needs to produce a, uh, a t statistic for a lot of data really quickly, then it might be worthwhile to go through this exercise and, and speed it up. And that is, I think, it for those two chapters. Um, if you guys haven't seen the R Inferno, it's, it's very um, uh, edutain, it's very edutational. <laughs> it's <laughs> It's entertaining and uh, also has a lot of good stuff in it. Um, written by somebody who uh, has, as we all do, a love-hate relationship with R, um, describing the you know, things that are kind of nuts about R and uh, um, also how to make them all better. And it's, it's nice. It was written, it's, it, it's in base R. It was written probably about 10 years ago now. So it's a good document. Um, OK, I think that's it. Yeah, so have you guys, uh, how much of this stuff have you guys done in your own, in your own work? Well, I've done profits. Uh, I have a bunch of APIs pulling, and whenever there's like a troubleshoot, I tend to call profits, but not too, too much. Is it, I mean, do you find that the um, issues kind of always in the same spot, or is it? Sorry, what do you mean? Well, um, yeah, I'm just thinking like one of my early experiences with it where I had a, some shiny code that I was you know, trying to get to go faster. And it's, you know, I get down to the, the plotting. The plotting was slow and there's no real way to speed that up. And at least I haven't gone back to look at it since I know more. But, um, oh, okay. So like, is it always the API, the uh, processing that's slow or the API calls? And yeah, it's usually in the processing that I try to add on and then it doesn't do what I wanted to. <laughs> Anybody else? No, I was this, uh, especially the profiling was for me the first time that I even uh, know that it exists. So I, I know it from um, JavaScript programming and web pages, but not in R. So yeah, it was really interesting for me, but I never used it, of course. And benchmarking, I never had such a case that they needed it, actually. My, my code, I can run it and the longest it takes is like five minutes. That was the hardest I do. Um, I only had to fix one problem for my uh, girlfriend on uh, on a cluster, but that was simply changing from uh, deeper data tables to uh, the data table package. So I, that solved the problem. So I, I never did any benchmarking. I just did. I, I knew it is quicker. So yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's quite helpful to to 
learned early on the <laughs> benchmarking at least uh, in biology I feel uh, I, because I what I've done uh, I, I don't I haven't done like the like always quantifying how how long does it take um, but sometimes because just because we have resources uh, in the cluster I just send it to multi-thread and, and then it's like I just separate my task in, in several threads and, and, and I don't care more about making it more efficient but I think I should probably um, try to do more on the uh, you know, on the benchmarking side um, to avoid using all the resources because we have it. <laughs> Yeah, and you also have to predefine the resources, or at least at our cluster. So it would be good if you know how long it runs with what um, dedicated um, cores, etc. And and that's that's for me that was also a, always a mystery. And I did some auto ML on Google Cloud. I don't know if you know that. That it's like auto machine learning from Google Cloud, uh, just for playing around. I, I don't know what I'm doing. So, but you know, there you play as as you go. And I had really, really, um, I was, I had calculated everything that I, I stay inside the free tier, <laughs> but it's really difficult to, to predict how long it takes. But you you, you have to get some smaller pieces and then calculate up. It was fun. Yeah. I'm trying to get if I've ever used uh, profiling for my own stuff. I, mean, I think like once or twice, but it's it's come up a couple of times in the in the Slack where you know somebody will ask like, okay, well how do I do this? And people have like four different solutions. So it's kind of fun to say, oh I wonder which which one's faster. You know and yeah yeah Done that a the times. benchmarking, especially, yeah. yeah. And and I, I think of a statistical standpoint, the, the last ex exercise with, with the d-test, I find it kind of funny because when I do a d-test so often <laughs> that I need to performance it up, I mean, t-test isn't the correct one for this properly <laughs> so well, as, well, as yeah. my basic statistics knowledge that would be like yeah yeah it would have to be something where you've got you know like thousands of list columns where you know running and you, you get new data every week and you've got an automated thing that you know has to get done in like you know an hour or something but yeah even with t-test i wouldn't think it would take that long with, with the base function but, yeah. You know, or, or if it's interactive, you know, like interactivity, it's it's really important on a shiny app to like if people are just staring at something and if nothing's happening, you know, even if you know, even if it's an in-house thing where they know that it's it's a prototype, they're still gonna be like, oh, I'd have to use this thing again. Um, and if you can speed up that that time, that can be important. Oh, that's a very good point. Yeah, if you have a server-side code and your server-side and your server isn't that good, or if you have a client side code um, and users use it on their phone, so you want it as performance as possible. So, yeah, it's a good point. Um, quick question in the book, was there a mention on profiling that it checks every now and then to see what the call stack is doing? Yeah, yeah, so that's that's how we uh, um, remember the term for it. Uh, um, this type of profiler, it's the way it works is it, uh, um, and actually I think in the, let's look in my in our studio, um, I think you can also specify what the time step is, but what it does is it, you know, it, it, uh, it starts and it, it uh, looks at when something executes and then at its next time step, it pauses everything and sees how long each of those has been running for. And it uses that to add up to you know how the profile looks. That's my limited understanding of it. Okay. Yeah, I don't, it just kind of sounds unintuitive almost. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, I mean, profiling's always seemed like something that's really useful, but it's always been kind of a mystery to me how it actually works. I, I now finally understand the flame graph, so I'm getting somewhere. 
yeah, I didn't know the uh, lazy evaluation would hit us like this. Yeah, yeah, that was interesting. Yeah, like if you're looking at that and you're not expecting it, you could be like, well, why is why is F executing this other function or I executing whatever it was in the example? And they also said it's like uh, if the function runs more than however many minutes, it's not even worth it because it's in such small increments. Or did I get that wrong? That's probably true. So it would have to be you'd have to be looking at the the stuff inside of it, the uh, um, you know, the calls that the function is doing. Um, yeah, I'm just reading through the profiling section. They're they're yeah, they say R is the um, there's a number of different types of profilers, but R uses a very fairly simple type called the sampling or statistical profiler. Uh, it stops the execution of code every few milliseconds and records the call stack. Um, and then yeah, I didn't see the part about the long running stuff. That would, but that would make sense if you have something that's you know taking like a minute to run, then you, you probably want to break it down anyway and, and look at the pieces. Yeah. I mean, you know, unless it's just something that you know is you know like a some kind of machine learning thing where you know that it's going to take a long time to to execute like a huge number of chains or something. Mm -hmm. So I, I would just slow it enormously down if I do profiling and machine learning because nothing would happen actually. Yeah, I was going to say without machine learning, oh, yeah. you really have no other option other than sticking with what we have. I mean, there's a t-test example that you guys walked through, but you know, everything's kind of there for you, if that makes sense. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, the, the machine learning, most of that is, um, isn't it the Markov chain thing going on? I have no idea. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's and that's all happening, you know, down in some C code, you know, yeah. like stand or yeah. something like that. Um, and I'm, I don't, I'm very so, much. So you would have any way to use a, a C profiler? Yeah. So if you wanted to, if you're into that, yeah, and I, I, I don't know enough about it to know, you know, where you would be optimizing, but like the. You know, in the limited amount that I've gone through the machine learning stuff in R, the part that you probably could op optimize is is how you're, you know, um, if if you you know again if you have a bunch of list columns where you're doing where you're doing the same thing on all of them, you could think about okay, well, how am I partitioning this stuff? Am I am I doing that as efficiently as I can? But once you get down to that C code, that's like you know that's de it's definitely more advanced than I am, but. You know, if you're somebody who's, if you're writing a new algorithm, then yeah, you'd want to work on that. But otherwise, we just have to kind of trust the people that wrote Stan or uh, um, or the other machine learning tools to 